All right, guys. Um, going to do a little lesson today. Probably only get about halfway through this um, on pricing strategies. All right, we are um, talking about the marketing mix right now um, in business. All right, um, it's one of the key concepts of marketing. The marketing mix is the four P's. The first one we went over is product. We're going to do a little review on that today. All right, um, and then the next part of that is price. All right, product, price. Then we have place and promotion as our final. Um, two of the four P's, all right? but today we're focusing on price, and we'll do a little review on product as well. Um, make sure you have the guided notes in front of you. I sent out a Word document as well as a PDF to both Google Classroom, excuse me, and as well to um, Plus Portals, right? and should be in your email. So uh, the reason I did both was if you'd like to type this up, you can open it up on a computer and open the Word document, and you know, type the notes if you'd like. Um, if you want to open it up in Notability as a note and uh, or as a PDF, um, inscribe the notes from there or type them in from there, that's fine as well. How, however you want to get it done, if you want to print it out at your house and fill it in, that's, that's totally fine. Um, but you will have to turn these notes in um, at the end of this lesson. So it will not be after this class. It will be after the next one. We're only going to get about halfway through this today. You do not need to turn in. Um, what you have today, but you do need to turn in um, the completed notes once we finish the the lecture totally. All right, try to make this as interesting as possible. Um, got a little arrow here. If you can see it, great. If not, it's going to make this awkward. All right, here we go. So we're going to do a little review on product first. Okay, so um, all of this is already filled out for you. Just follow along. I think this is the the key concepts of product thus far. All right, so the product refers to the good, service, or idea being sold. All right, make sure you know the difference between good service and idea. It must be designed intentionally, right? So the product must be designed intentionally and deliver a minimum level of performance, right? So, um, you know, that just means really a minimum level of performance, a satisfaction really from the consumer of the target market, okay? Um, so, it, you know, if you get a pair of Beats headphones and you're like, wow, these look really cool um, and they don't sound as good, right? Well, then, you know, the performance isn't there or maybe you... Um, get the Beats headphones and the logo on the side of it like scratches off and wears away within like two weeks and you can't even tell they're Beats anymore. You know, that would affect the, the level of performance, right? You expect you have standards, right? Um, the target market will have standards for your product and if they're not met, um, then the other three Ps won't do any good. Right? So that's really the key point here is that your product has to match what people want. All right, next... Um, we talked about the target market, so how do we figure out what the target market is? All right, so just going back to this, it's designed intentionally to a specific target market, right? So you're designing it so that it fits the person that you want to sell it to, right? Um, so, you know, again, um, I, we went through the, the pink shoes, right, um, two lessons ago. We talked about, you know, the pink shoes versus the cowboy boots um, in the assignment, right? You know, pink light-up shoes, right, those are going to be more aimed at a a girl toddler, right? Um, so yeah, uh, again, designing it intentionally for the target market. So what is the target market? It's a particular group of consumers at which a product, service, or idea is aimed. And that's exactly, it. it's the target, right? It's who you're going after. Um, you know, if you are just, let's say you're, you're, you're um, taking an archery lesson, right? And the, the guy's showing you exactly how to do it. You hit the bullseye, you get the most points. Right, and you just say, "Ah, now leave me alone. I don't need, I don't need your help." Right, and you just start firing off arrows right and into the distance, having no idea how to aim. Right, you know you're going to be all over the target. You may miss the target. Right, um, but the chances are you're not going to get very many bullseyes. Right, so you're going to get um, only so many points, and it's a waste of energy. It's a waste of time for you. Right, um, versus if you would have just let the guy teach you. Right, um, how to shoot the arrow, you may have been more accurate and may have gotten more points and. Um, spent less energy, right? And that's kind of the same idea as finding the target market. Is you're trying to look for the bullseye, right? Um, that's where you get the most points. That's where you'll make the most money, right? So if, if you're selling Life Alert, right, which is the uh, you know it's, it's designed for for older people, um, you know if they fall over and they don't live with someone, right? Sometimes they can break a hip and they can be in trouble, right? So again, Life Alert is aimed more at, at the elderly, right? So if you're trying to sell that in a high school, kids are going to think you're crazy. Right, and you're just going to waste a lot of time and energy trying to sell a product that's not meant for you know for that audience. Right, so again, determining the target market is very important because it's going to save us time, energy, and what's most important in business, of course, is saving us all the money that we need. Right, 
So how do we do this? We use market segmentation, which is break down the market into segments, okay? So we can break these down by demographics, which include age, gender, income, education. We can do it by geography, right? So what country, city, language, or climate, potentially. There's also more than that, psychographics, lifestyle of the individuals, right? The activities that they're interested in, their interests, their values, right? And then, of course, behavioral, um, their expectations of the product itself, right, or service, their intent to use the product or service, right? Um, maybe the occasion, right? Maybe there's a, a certain occasion going on. Um, and then the life cycle as well, right? The life cycle of the product. So if the product is growing, that may uh, interest someone way more than if the product is in decline, all right? And then finally, we went through the four product life cycles. The most common is traditional, introduction, slow growth, then it goes into growth, right, which is where the most rapid sales are occurring. It reaches maturity, and unless the product is changed, right, um, unless there's some kind of product extension, then there will, there will be a decline in the sales of the product over time, of course, right? Um, a fad is a sharp, short-term growth in sales. So the product is introduced, people see it, all of a sudden it spreads like wildfire, but then it follow, it's followed by a sharp decline. Think about fidget spinners. Niche markets, small consumer base, there's little competition, right? Um, it's consistent but minor long-term sales growth. So um, it's, a, it's a small consumer base, so you're not going to have um, huge sales, right? It's a small base, uh, a small market. Um, there's not that much competition, so that's definitely a pro to this, but the con is that you're not going to have major long-term, you know, major growth, right? It's not going to be major growth. You're just going to have a consistent, strong base of market, right? A small market. Um, and then an example of that is, you know, um, you can do gluten-free foods, right? Gluten-free foods. Um, maybe that is a, uh, you know, specifically for people who are on gluten diets or celiac have, have allergies to, to gluten, right? That, that is a niche market, right? Most people do not need to buy or want to buy gluten-free food, right? But, uh, there are people out there that do, trust me. All right. And then finally, seasonal. Sales spike during specific seasons and dip during the off season. So Ocean City, right, the business is there in the summertime, take off, and then in the wintertime, they die down. As we've talked about in the past, you can think about ski resorts, water parks. There's a whole bunch of things that you can, um, that you can think of in there, all right? Let's continue on, and we're going to get into price strategy, 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 all right? So pricing strategy, objectives is to define price to identify numerous pricing strategies and their purpose in marketing, and to apply decision-making skills in selecting the appropriate pricing strategy. So eventually, we're going to need to be able to apply the appropriate strategy to the business and product, okay? Those are all written down for you. All right, so as we get into this, the, first, uh, the second of the four Ps is price, and that's where we're at, all right? So it's going to be time to start filling in the guided notes. So uh, price. All right, what does it mean? All right, well, price obviously refers to the value that is uh, put for a product, okay? The value that is put for a product. So fill that in when you got guided notes. All right, you can just follow along with each slide. Depends on cost of production, all right? So what does the price depend on? It depends on the cost of production, the segment targeted, and the ability to pay, you know, the ability to pay for the, that individual, all right? That, or who, you know, the consumer base, um, and then supply and demand as well. There's Numerous other factors, okay, but these are the, the most important, right? So it depends on cost of production, right? So if it costs me $100 to make something, I can't sell it for $50. It doesn't make any sense. You're losing money, right? So cost of production, the segment targeted, you identify a target market, and you have to understand um, what their abilities are to pay, um, you know, what they're looking for in the product itself, right? But cost plays a major role in that. So you need to know your target market. And then finally, supply and demand, right? If you... Uh, um, or selling them like hotcakes, right? They're, they're just flying off the shelves. You may need to raise the price, right? Because um, you may end up with a shortage, which is which is a huge issue. Or vice versa. If you're not selling any of the product at all, you may have to figure out a way to lower the price um, in order to reach that equilibrium price, which we'll hear again. Remember, equilibrium from supply and demand. Pricing strategies are tied to the business plan, all right? So um, these have to fall in line with what your business is, right? Um, Peloton, right, nowadays, as we've talked about, are a high-end um, home gym uh, application um, exercise machine, right? Um, it is it is interactive, um, but it is definitely a higher class 
item, right? A luxury item to have. It's expensive, right? Um, and, and it matches exactly that, right? The price matches um, the target market, which is definitely, um, again, a luxury item um, for wealthier, right? For wealthier people. Right, potentially, you know, and you've seen the commercials. It's it's moms or dads that are busy that don't have time to go to the gym, that get up early in the morning and they're, you know, sky rise, uh, you know, super nice penthouse suite. You've seen them before, right? Again, the price of those is high um, to match exactly the market that they're going for. So it's tied to the business plan versus food from Aldi, right? They it looks cheap, you know. Um, you you walk down the aisles, you know what is a cheaper good. You look at the price and it is cheap, right? Um, again, that is the business plan of Aldi is to sell the groceries for cheaper prices. So the strategies are tied directly to the business plan and they're used to differentiate and enhance product image. So the question asks, um, how can price how can price differentiate and enhance product image? You know, how can it differentiate it? Right? It can differentiate it. Uh, we talked about the the pancakes, right? The pancake mix. Uh, uh, what was it called? I told you about it on Shark Tank. I had to pause it and look it up. It was Kodiak Cakes, right? Um, again, they uh, looked at the market and realized that there was not a luxury um, level pancake mix, right? They just had a bunch of people kind of um, jousting for position, you know, for, for market share um, at the cheaper level, right? With Hungry Jack and Aunt Jemima, um, Bisquick, etc. right? So Kodiak Cakes, right, uh, you know, differentiated their product by, first of all, the price. It was more, ex it was much more expensive than the regular pancake mix that was given out. Um, and that enhances the product image. People see the, the higher price, right? If you go and you're getting um, coffee and you see higher price or whatever it might be at the grocery store, you see higher price, you think, better quality first you know it's the first thing most people think of um it's not always the case but that is something that psychologically affects us as humans so again um, understand that price is used to differentiate and enhance product image you see different pr uh, prices on the shelf immediately when you see the higher price you think that is a that must be a fantastic item right there it's not always true right it's not always true sometimes it's there to trick us all right so what is pricing strategy moving right on A business can use a variety of pricing strategies when selling a product service idea. Right? So there's a variety of reasons you know, or a variety of strategies, excuse me, um, that a business can use when they're selling their product service or idea. Right? So um, these reasons are separate. They're not all the same reasons. Right? These are separate reasons. So they may set a price to maximize profit. A business might say, let's set the price to make as much money as we possibly can. They may set the price to defend against new competitors, right, or increase their market share. So, um, you know, if you're a sandwich shop and a, you know, you've been there for a long time and a, and a, and a chain sub shop, you know, pops up next to you and um, you, you can try to drive them out of the market by lowering the price of your subs substantially um, so that the new competitors can't compete with you, right, and they end up getting – basically bought out of the market, right? So it increases your market share. So that could be a benefit, a benefit of that as well. So you may have a lower price and you know, you might take a loss for a little while, but the long-term benefits of getting rid of that other business that was competing against you, um, outweighs the short-term loss, right? Um, so again, it's not always to maximize profit. Sometimes the prices are set low to lose money or to break even, um, so that you can survive, right? And we'll get to that. Price is set to meet the needs and behaviors of the target market. All right. This is probably, you know, the most common is trying to meet the needs and the behaviors of your target market. You ha find the target market and you realize that if you can accurately identify who your target market is, if you can meet, set the price and the, and, and the design of the product to meet the customer's needs, you are going to sell a lot of products, right? A lot of products. And that will be right at the equilibrium price. So it's critical to find the right pricing strategy. It really depends on the business, the company, the industry, the, the market, um, all, all, there's a ton of factors that, that play into it. Um, so we're going to kind of discuss those a little bit. You may not be familiar with all of them, but as long as you understand the basic idea of each strategy, I think that's what's going to be important today. All right, let's get into the pricing strategy objectives. Uh, it says on your sheet, they can vary for each business, so list the pricing strategy objectives below. Um, just quickly list these as I go through them. All right, we have long run and short term profits. All right, um, so could be a strategy to uh, get long run profits, right? Or it could be for short term gain, right? Um, we're going to talk about Apple iPhones, how, you know, when they launch a new phone, 
right? Uh, the price is extremely high, and you have lines out the door. How does that happen? Well, again, they're making short-term profit. Eventually, the price will go down, which is a pricing strategy, right, that we see from um, a lot of companies such as Apple for their phones or for a product that is is really wanted by a lot of people. And we'll, we'll explain who those are. But that could be for short-run profits, right? Could be to increase sales volume. Could be for company growth. You could make the price to match competition. So, um, you know, if you think your competitors that are, are similar to you um, and they've used a successful pricing strategy, you could just copy their, their strategy and match the competition. Um, more objectives create interest in your product or excitement. I'm going to talk about a product that I bought off of Amazon that was competing in, you know, much smaller to uh, Under Armour, Nike, and it was performance wear. Um, it was just very cheap. Um, and they had just launched and they were trying to get some, some people interested and excited about their product. I'll tell you how that went. Um, social ethical objectives, companies could have objectives socially or ethically, right? Um, some, uh, we watched a episode on Shark Tank of the guy who, um, wanted his products to be made in the United States because he disagreed with the way that labor was treated overseas. So again, he had to price his product much higher because of his ethical, um, standing there. Could be to discourage new um, entrants, right? People from entering into the competition, right? So again, that's that low pricing to discourage people from entering your market. And it could just be for survival, right? Um, it could just be for survival. So sometimes you need to stick things out, and the price of your product is what's depend. You know what's going to make you the money, what's going to make you the revenue, what's going to make you the profit. But sometimes, um, especially with competition, you need to set prices to survive. All right, I have this um, graphic organizer on your guided notes, so just go ahead and fill that in, right? Um, it's the factors that affect price decisions, right? The factors that affect pricing, all right? Um, the first one, all right? Organizational and marketing objectives, which we just talked about. Pricing objectives we've talked about, all right? Um, those, depending upon the objective, will influence your pricing decision. The cost to make the product, uh, we have on the top there other marketing mix variables. Of course, there's um, too many to list, all right, but these are, again, the major ones. Channel member ex expectations. So, again, this could be um, the channel member being the distribution channel. Right? So you, you you know, the price of your product may be affected by what the expectations of the people who are buying these products from you. Right? They may only be able to purchase it at a certain price. So you do not want to price yourself out. Customer interpretation and response, right? So if customers, you know, buy the product and they do not like it or they don't think the quality is there for the price, you may need to lower the price, right, based on the um, customer's opinions, interpretation, and response. You may have to make decisions based on the competition. And legal and regulatory issues, right? Um, we're going to talk about a strategy that's illegal, but it's still often used because it's hard to... Um, fight against it. Right? It's hard when, when there's allegations made. A lot of the business get away with it. Right? So we'll talk about why that is. All right, these are the pricing strategies. We're going to go through them one at a time so you don't need to write them down right now in your guided notes. Um, we're going to have them. Um, there's eight of them. Right? The most common there being on the left side. Um, and then there's others. And they're very common as well. Um, but the, the key ones I think are the, the ones on the left. Um, let's just get started here. All right, so first we have cost plus pricing. So it says in your guided notes, what is cost plus pricing? It's a strategy that is used to maximize the rates of return of comp uh, the rates of return of companies. All right, so a strategy used to maximize the rates of return of companies. All right, so the return is what you basically make off of the uh, of the product. All right, um, after you factor in the cost to produce that product. All right, so. Um, what companies will do is they'll look at the cost, they'll add a markup to that. So they'll say, okay, it costs us um, $5 to make this, right? We want to make uh, $10 off of each product that we sell. So we'd have to sell it for $15, right? Because it costs $5 to make. We want to make 10 total. We have to sell it for $15 um, in order to get a, rate, uh, a return of $10. So. Um, the cost is the cost to produce, the markup is the desired return, and that will give us our selling price. So the example I have here is I'm selling bracelets that cost 50 cents each to make. All right. If I want a $1.50 return on each bracelet sold, 
um, then I'm going to have to end up selling it for $2, as you can see there in the equation I have below. All right, moving right along here. And, and again, that pricing strategy, we're going to talk about which type of businesses should use that, but it might be smart to start thinking about this, right? Um, you know, the person that's selling the bracelets there sounds like they don't have any competition, right? So they can they can just come up with the desired return that, they, that they're seeking, right, without having to worry about competitors. So this is really good for, um, you know, a brand new cutting edge idea um, that, you know, people may not be familiar with yet, um, but there has to be a lack of competition because once competition enters into it, you can't just come up with your desired return. You're going to have to play to the consumer. All right, value-based pricing. So the goal of value-based pricing, it's, it asks you what's the goals, right? There's really one major goal here is to figure out how much your customers are willing to pay, right? So what is the value that, that your, your customers, and when I say your customers, again, it's really talking about your target market, right? So figuring out how much your target market is willing to pay. You want to maximize revenue by charging exact uh, the exact amount that they are willing to pay, which is the equilibrium price. So if you can figure that out, again, um, we talked about that previously, right? finding that equilibrium based on the supply and demand. So you need to figure out that equilibrium price, um, and there's a few ways to implement this. All right? First of all, figuring out the, willing, the, the willingness to pay. What's the perceived value um, of the product or service or idea for the, for the target market? Next, you have to build the best product, right? Price should reflect the product package, design, and the features. So, um, you know, customers are going to say, wow, well, this product's great, right? They're, are they willing to pay for it? Well, based on the, the package and design, sure, right? They, they like the way it looks. Um, but now that product has to work and the features have to pull through that, that keep the customer interested, right? Um, so the willingness to pay falls right in line with being able to build the best product that customers are going to be interested in. And you also, the last way you have to do this is you have to get to know your customers. You have to focus on customer opinions. You have to focus on the opinions, and you may need to change things based on the reactions um, and feedback that you're getting from the customer base. And that's very important to focus on the customers, especially with value-based pricing. Feel free to pause the video at any time um, to get caught up. All right. Next, we have competitive pricing. All right, this is our third strategy here, competitive pricing. This is setting the price at the same level as one's competitors. Setting the price at the same level as one competitor, one's competitors. So, um, again, this is going to happen in a competitive industry. But well, here's what it relies on. It relies on the idea that competitors have worked thoroughly on their pricing. So let's say you're entering into a market and you don't know what to price your product at, but you're in a market where there's already tons of successful businesses um, running that have very similar, if not the same exact product. Look at gas, right? If you um, are ever at a gas station, look around um, and see if there are any other gas stations in the area and check the prices, right? They're not going to be very different. They're going to be very close to each other. Um, again, you have to rely on the idea that the competitors have worked thoroughly on their pricing, that they are um, making a specific rate of return. They have maybe found the equilibrium price of that target market, right? so it relies on that. In any market, firms sell the same or very similar products, therefore equilibrium price should be the same. So the example here is, I want to sell bracelets at school. Mary is already selling similar bracelets for a dollar. She's doing really well. So we will use comp uh, competitive pricing strategy and sell our bracelets for $1 as well to match our competitor and hopefully gain some market, uh, market share. All right. And depending upon how good our product is, we might be able to um, boot her out of the market. All right, the fourth one is price skimming. So fill in the blanks there on the guided notes. Sell, setting a relatively high price at launch and lowering it as the market or the demand curve evolve, right? The market slash the demand curve evolve. So you set the price high to start, all right, and lower it as the market or the demand curve evolve. All right, so um, we're going to look at this in a second. We should be thinking iPhone, right, iPhones. The initial price of the iPhone X was... What a thousand dollars, right? 
That price will go down as new models are released, right? The phones still work. It's not like a new model comes out and the other ones don't work, although that was something Apple got in trouble for. We'll talk about that later. But again, the price starts high. People are crazy for the iPhones, right? And you have these people known as early adopters, right? And this, this model really relies on early adopters. Early adopters are customers who are uh, who will pay, who are will pay. It's a typo. Customers who will pay steeper prices for cutting edge or the must-have product. Right? And iPhones tend to be like that when they come out. Right? The three cameras, you know, the um, the new eye match right? or eye recognition, right? All that, all the crazy stuff that the uh, the new iPhones have. Um, it's cutting edge, but it's the must-have product, right? Your texts are blue with each other, so um, you want to have that product, right? And having the newest one, you know, boosts your esteem. All right. So it relies on those early adopters who are willing to pay that high price for the product so they can show it off to their friends all right, for all the reasons. The price is eventually lowered to attract more price-sensitive customers. All right. um, you know, Apple's done something interesting with this where they came out with the iPhone 8 and the 10 at the same time. Right? This wasn't price skimming, but this was coming out with two separate products at the same time. One was at a lower price, right? The iPhone 8, and then the iPhone 10, which had all the new bells and whistles, was set at a thousand dollars, right? Um, it's kind of similar to that, though, in that once the new phones start coming out, once the 10 came out, now the 11, right? The price of the 10 is going to drop so that um, it can enter multiple market segments, right? Especially um, income and willingness to pay for a product. Once the early adopters are done paying, right, we might need to lower that price so we can have new people, um, a new market of people, right, the surplus that still exists out there that we're looking for lower prices of the product. So the let's look at the graph here. If you see this, as we lower the price three times, right, P1, P2, P3, right, we get the, the customer surplus, right? So you can see the curve. Once the early adopters start to flatten out, we lower the price. We get more sales, right, the quantity demanded. Um, once that flattens out again, we have to lower the price again, right? Um, so the example is definitely iPhones. Right? They, the, they charge very high price at the new phone launch, and the price eventually drops over time to increase the availability to other market segments. All right. The last of the common, right, or the most common is penetration pricing. All right, this is a strategy used to quickly gain market share by setting an initially low price to entice customers. All right, so uh, penetration pricing, right, means to enter into the market, right? You, you want to find a price that um, allows you to enter into a competitive market. All right, it's generally used by new entrants into the market, and the goals are to increase market share, establish brand loyalty, pull customers from competitors, and generate demand. So again, increase that. That error means increase market share, establish brand loyalty, pull customers from competitors, and generate demand. And when should you use this type of pricing? Right, um, when there's minimal product differentiation. Right. So again, um, I'm going to talk about when I was looking for a cheaper alternative than Under Armour and Nike, right? and I went after Kraft Sportswear. Right. Um, you know, it has the, the sweat moisture wicking fabric, right? It's basically a very similar product to Under Armour, to Nike, to what they have to offer, just at a much cheaper price, right? So again, um, they're trying to pull, is much cheaper, right? Trying to pull people away from buying Under Armour and buying Nike, those who maybe aren't willing to pay as much for um, those products. So, um, Again, to pull from competitors and also to generate demand. So this is a great strategy if you are just coming in to the market. You're just starting out, but no one knows who you are. So Kraft Sportswear, they're actually they're actually blowing up right now. I've heard they've gotten a lot bigger, but I had a bad experience with them. Um, at launch, they sold their performance clothing on Amazon. It was comparable to Under Armour, as I said, with the fabric, the material used, right, the, the purpose. It was a much lower price. I gave it a shot, and... The shorts that I got came ripped. Um, the shirts, when I washed them, uh, wrinkled up. Um, they were basically unusable. Um, they shrunk pretty drastically, and um, you know, I, I didn't. They didn't generate the brand loyalty that they probably had hoped. 
Um, I ended up purchasing some Under Armour stuff not long after. Um, so it didn't work there. But that is the idea of penetration pricing. We will finish the rest next class. You do not need to submit anything. Thanks, guys.